the CARES Act, created new protections for student loan borrowers to help during this crisis. To explain more about these new protections and to answer your questions, she has invited Jessica Thompson and Michelle Streeter from the Institute for College Access and Success to join this call. TICAS is a trusted source of research, design, and advocacy for student-centered public policies that promote affordability, accountability, and equity in higher education. They are based in Washington, DC, and have an office in Oakland, California. If you've just joined us, welcome to Congresswoman Bonamici's town hall about the federal resources that are available to student loan borrowers during this pandemic. If you would like to ask a question during the question and answer section, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now we'll go ahead and get started. Here is Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Terrific. Thank you so much, Ali, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I have my wonderful staff who have helped set up this call as well as the staff of TICUS. I'm so glad we have with us today uh, Jennifer, Jessica Thompson and Michelle Streeter. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, they're from the Institute for College Access and Success, and we'll probably refer to them as TICUS for the call. Uh, these are incredibly challenging times for so many. Even before the uh, coronavirus pandemic, I was hearing from borrowers that their student loan debt was overwhelming and stressful uh, for many reasons. And I've had countless conversations with Oregonians. Uh, I had a student debt clinic earlier this year. I had a roundtable conversation with uh, several um, people who were in the public service loan forgiveness program. I've received lots of letters and emails, and I had a survey on my website as well to get input. Um, and of course, since the start of the pandemic, borrowers have been saying that they're struggling even more now. Sometimes they're forced to choose to buy groceries, um, they have unexpected expenses, paying for childcare, which is already expensive, or making unaffordable student loan payments. They're doing all they can to get by during these challenging times but every day is a struggle. Uh, and that's one of the things that this pandemic is uh, contributing to the, the stress and the taking a toll on, on people here. So my colleagues and I in, in Congress have been uh, working hard to provide student loan relief in recently passed legislation. Um, I know it may not be easy to navigate these programs and that's why I'm glad I have the expertise here from TICAS. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to do with this webinar is to connect you with resources and to help answer you, your questions. So I'm going to give just a brief um, update about my work in Congress and then we'll hear from Jessica and Michelle and as, as you're there, student loan experts. Uh, and then most important, we want to hear from you. We want to take your questions and find out how you are doing during these challenging times. Um, also, I want to let everyone know this event is being live streamed and a recorded version will be shared afterward. So Congress has passed three bills already to address with the coronavirus pandemic. The first was an $8.3 billion emergency funding bill, and that was funding for testing, for research, for small businesses. Then we passed a bill called the Families First Coronavirus Act, and that included paid sick leave, unemployment insurance, and my bipartisan bill to make sure that students can get school meals, even though their kids, uh, their schools are closed. Those kids are still getting their school meals, and we've been working with the school districts to make that happen. And then the big bill, the CARES Act, that passed at the end of March, uh, direct payments to individuals. Uh, those are just starting to arrive uh, in people's uh, bank accounts. Uh, expanded unemployment insurance, which is so important during these challenging times. And then significant amount of relief for small businesses. Uh, forgivable loans in something called the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, intended to help small businesses, nonprofits, things like arts organizations, all those small businesses that have been struggling to help them retain their employees. Now we know that the program is not, has, the rollout has not been as smooth as, as it could be and should be and the program is not reaching many of the small businesses that need it. So we're continuing to work on access for them. And then we also included additional resources for healthcare workers. I've heard so much about that 
personal protective equipment that not only healthcare workers, but the essential workers who are on the front lines, people who are working in the grocery stores, first responders, they all need personal protective equipment. And we know about the shortage there. So we've been working hard, you know, calling Health and Human Services leadership, doing everything we can. We've seen a lot of manufacturers step up and start making some of that. Uh, so that was a, a big part of the bill. Also funding to help our local school districts and systems and higher education. And that includes funding that can be used to support distance education, the remote learning, but also provide emergency grants to students. And then finally, and importantly, last but not least, uh, the bill included significant relief for student loan borrowers. There's a six month pause on payment and the accrual of interest uh, for student loan borrowers for, for most federal student loans, a suspension of collection on federally insured student loans. Now, I know we have much more work to do to not only spread, slow the spread of the virus and to support families and frontline workers and stabilize the economy, but also to support those small businesses and students and borrowers. So now we're working on additional legislation that's still evolving. Uh, I will continue in the fight for student loan borrowers. We know that we need to expand the protections that now exist for federal student loans to all private student loan borrowers and all federal student loan borrowers to make sure that there's no gap there uh, and that we don't still have um, people struggling because right now, honestly, too many people are left out uh, and they're uh, frankly confused about why they aren't getting relief and other student loan borrowers are. So we're trying to fill those gaps. Um, it's also important to make sure that those borrowers don't fall into default once we reach the end of the six months. So I'm working to, to knock down some of the barriers that stand in the way there and help as much as possible. Uh, and then building on the CARES Act, expanding those direct payments. Those should last at least until the end of the pandemic. It was a one-time payment. That's not enough to get, uh, to get families by. So we're working on all of these. Uh, the, the coronavirus has helped expose a lot of inequities in our system. For example, lack of broadband access to students who um, are expected to be doing remote learning, but may not have the, either the technology or the connection. So we're working on all of these areas and know that uh, student loan borrowers are uh, certainly a priority for myself and many of my colleagues and we'll be uh, advocating for those protections as we move forward. So I wanna turn it over to Jessica and Michelle uh, from TCAS for more information about the new protections in place to help student loan borrowers and then look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, hello everyone. And I wanna really wanna thank Congresswoman Bonamici and her wonderful staff for setting, helping us set up this event today and for hosting this event today and inviting us at TGIFs to participate. Uh, as a Congresswoman said, and these are really hard times for all of uh, us in many different ways. And I'm very grateful that we can use technology right now to get together virtually and provide a lot of crucial information and support each other uh, in those ways. And today in particular around student debt. Uh, and I thank the Congresswoman for uh, always making sure that student debt is um, up there and, and, and being focused on alongside all those other really important issues you, you just heard her mention. So my name is Jessica Thompson and I'm Associate Vice President here at the Institute for College Access and Success. I just wanna say a couple quick things about TICUS. Uh, and that is that, you know, we are a national nonpartisan nonprofit. Uh, we have been focused on making college more affordable and accessible for 15 years now. We're based in Oakland and Washington, D.C., and we do federal policy work uh, in higher education and also the state policy uh, work in California. And I want to say we have three key goals that we really focus on, increasing college access and affordability for all students, uh, and also in de creating a decrease in equity gaps. Uh, that we see for who attends college and who, who completes college by race and by income. Uh, we also seek to reduce the need for students to borrow to pay for college at all. And we also work on making it easier for anyone who does have student debt to manage that debt. Uh, and we also focus on ways for improving uh, the ways in which schools are held accountable for serving students well. So my colleague, Michelle Streeter, is also here with us today. And she's gonna kick us off by giving a bit of the overview of the new policies uh, that are in place right now to address uh, the burden of student debt during this particular crisis. 
Uh, and as mentioned, there are certainly some coverage gaps and other issues that remain uh, important to for Congress to work on as quickly as possible. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Michelle will give a bit of an overview and then we look forward to the specific questions folks might have based on the experiences they are dealing with. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, my name is Michelle Streeter. I'm a policy analyst at TICUS. I focus on federal policy issues, including student loan debt. I would also like to thank Congresswoman Bonamici for her leadership on these issues over the years and for her wonderful staff uh, for inviting us this evening. Um, so over the past month, um, there have been, I'm sure all of you attending have seen a number of announcements about efforts uh, from the federal government to help student loan borrowers during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so we're here to help you kind of sort out what all of that means for you individually. Um, so on March 27th, uh, a massive, massive economic relief bill was passed uh, into law. It was called the CARES Act. Um, and as the Congresswoman mentioned, this bill includes significant relief for federal student loan borrowers. Um, specifically, the bill directed the US Department of Education to automatically suspend payments on most federal student loans for the period from March 13th through September 30th of this year, and no interest will accrue on loans during this time. After September 30th, 2020, this payment suspension and interest waiver will come to an end. Uh, and borrowers will need to resume making payments on their loans uh, and the interest rate that you had before the interest waiver went into place on March 13th will be reinstated. Um, so in short, if your loans are covered, um, which we will touch on more in a bit, um, almost 90% of federal student loans are covered by these benefits. Um, you do not need to worry about making loan payments until October 1st of this year. Um, there will be no penalty for not making payments and your loan will not go into delinquency or default uh, no matter what. Um, and you do not have to take any action to receive these benefits. Um, because there is a time lag between when the benefit started and when the Department of Education was able to put them into action, um, your student loan servicers are actually automatically applying any interest you may have paid after the March 13th start date um, to the principal balance of your loan. Um, you also have the option, um, if you have made a payment between March 13th and when the Department of Education was able to operationalize the law, you do have the option of obtaining a full refund of any payments that were made um, after March 13th. Um, in order to get this refund, you would have to contact your loan servicer, but it is available to you. Um, there are a number of other details about these provisions that we will be happy to touch on, and I imagine there are a number of constituent questions that we want to turn to. So I will kind of turn it back over to the moderator and look forward to answering any questions. Great, um, well, thank you very much. So we'll now move on to questions for Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici and our guests from the Institute for College Access and Success, or TICUS, Jessica Thompson and Michelle Streeter. They will answer a mix of questions that were submitted before the event and questions from live participants. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom page to submit a question. I will read out the screen name to let people know when it's their turn, and I will then unmute their line. Our first question was submitted before the event by Joshua from McMinnville. Joshua asks, what can be done to make policies fair to all borrowers? Private lenders do not seem to be included in plans so far. Well, that's a great question, Joshua. And as I mentioned, the CARES Act only included the federal um, student loans, but not the private student loans. And you're right, it is an equity issue. And it's one of the reasons why I am fighting to expand those protections so that they cover all student loan borrowers, not just the federal student loans. Uh, we have seen inequities in a lot of these um, programs. And it's something that I'm, as the, the chair of the uh, subcommittee on civil rights and human services always looking at with an equity lens so because you have or someone you know has a private loan does not mean that you should not uh, be entitled to some relief especially during these incredibly challenging times i do want to mention a couple of the things that i've been working on uh, even before the pandemic and that is making sure that uh, people who would benefit from income driven repayment are in income driven repayment plans um, and also automatic um, connection between 
the Treasury and the Department of Education to update income information so people don't fall into default. So that's something I've been been working uh, working on as well. But you're absolutely right, and I'll ask uh, Jessica and Michelle if they have any thoughts on the. the it is it is not. Uh, equitable now that uh, some loans are covered and some are not. So I'll ask uh, Jessica and Michelle if they want to weigh in on that as well. Yeah, um, I will say that uh, I agree that it is a difficult situation that the private debt uh, is not currently covered. And we'll talk a little bit more also about the uh, sliver of the, the portion of federal debt actually that also is not not covered. And I do think that while we work to advocate for closing that coverage gap, in the meantime, it is gonna be really important that you do proact do contact your lender uh, to see what they are able and willing to do for you. Uh, and while, it, while that, those loans are not covered currently by uh, the, the laws that Congress passed, there are things, uh, there are lenders that are taking uh, actions and providing, um, uh, negotiating some relief uh, for borrowers of private mm -hmm. debt. I will also say that it's important to weigh in also with your governors. Uh, we are seeing that, um, for example, Governor Cuomo uh, negotiated uh, a sort of broad uh, ability, uh, a broad agreement with some of the private lenders to provide relief to all New Yorkers. Uh, now, this is not an ideal like policy approach uh, to do this in a patchwork way. There's lots of equity issues, we, we agree. Um, but in the meantime, uh, it, it is important too to uh, make sure that you're reaching out proactively and, and seeing if they, you can um, you know, get either others to continue to, to advocate and, and push on this issue and also see what your lender can offer you while we continue to work uh, toward a broader solution. Michelle, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I would just echo everything that uh, Jessica said around kind of the, the unfortunate um, coverage gap and the equity issues here. And I think as Jessica shared, um, it is imperative that if you have any, any issue with making payments or even just any questions about what your best way to manage your loans during this time is that you contact your lender. And if you have trouble with that, um, or if you're not receiving the right information that you need, um, there are there is recourse for you to reach out through the federal government, through the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, through your state consumer agencies, and of course, through your Congresswoman's office. Right. Um, so Please all of those my office. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. We have, we yeah. have um, wonderful constituent caseworkers. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joshua. Do we have another question? We do. So as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of our Zoom page. I will read out the screen name to let people know when it's their turn, and then I'll unmute your line. Our first question will be from the caller with the screen name Amy Magnuson. Your line has been unmuted. Hi, Amy. Great. It looks like we're just um, waiting for looks Amy like to Amy join. Amy might be, I see a mute button. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, of course. Thanks for Hi, hosting Amy. this. Hi. Um, thanks for hosting this session. I'm a TRIO um, student support services advisor and so work with a lot of students that have a high level of loan debt. Um, mm -hmm. And there are two questions that I have. One is, um, it seemed like there were some ideas out there about loan forgiveness being floated that aren't included in the CARE Act. I'm curious about if that's a plan for the future. And the second is, are there plans moving forward to lower the interest rate on student loans? It, it seems kind of crazy that you can buy a car and pay less interest on that than a, a college education. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And they're both great questions. Um, and uh, I tell you, the TRIO program is so important. So thank you. Thank you for your work. Um, big supporter of TRIO and Gear Up and all the programs that help, um, especially first generation students. But uh, thank you. And, and forgiveness, yes, there is a proposal um, for uh, $10,000 forgiveness. That is um, something that we absolutely need to put on the table um, because these are really challenging times. And a lot of people are thinking, okay, you're telling me that in September, after September and October, I have to start making my payments again. And people don't even know what the economy will be like. They don't know if they'll be back in school. They don't know if they'll be back at work. So it is a really good question and something that we should be talking about um, as we work toward debt-free college. And I know that's something that Jessica mentioned in the in the, um, the mission of TCAS is that we have to find ways for people to get through school without accruing a lot of debt. when 
when I went, I went to community college for two years. I did it all on my own. I did community college for two years, and then I did university for two years and law school for three years. So I had seven years. I had a combination of um, grants, loans, work study, food stamps, everything I needed to help me get through those seven years. And after seven years, I had a really manageable amount of debt. And that's not what I'm hearing. And I went into public service. I could have gone to a law firm. I went into public service and it still wasn't an issue. It wasn't a burden. Uh, we just don't hear that now. And higher education, all education, it's a really good investment. You can look at, talk to economists and look at the data. When we invest in education, uh, it is a good investment that pays off in the long run and making sure that, that finances are not a barrier for anyone. And should people be able to refinance? Absolutely. It's absurd that they can't. Um, and we've had many conversations about it. There are, because um, we work with the federal student loan program, refinancing to lower rates would have a price tag. And so there's always a debate about, well, how are we gonna pay for it? Where are we gonna get the resources? But uh, I absolutely believe that there are other places where we can, can uh, make cuts and make differences. We need to allow people to refinance your student loans um, and, and also have, uh, Again, as I mentioned before, more income-driven repayment, more programs that help uh, people who are struggling. So that if we had the $10,000 debt forgiveness, it would make a tremendous amount of difference. A lot of the people who go into default, in fact, owe $10,000 or less, and, and it affects their credit, it affects what they can do uh, to enter the economy. So uh, it's a good proposal that should be on the table and we'll continue to talk about it. Thank you. Is that your dog? It's really cute. Oh, yes, <laughs> it is. Thanks yes, for your question is. and for your work. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have another question, Allie? We do. Um, our next question was submitted before the event um, by Jeffrey in Portland. And Jeffrey asks, how will non-payments during this time affect credit, IBR, and PSLF payments? Well, that, that's, that's a good question as well, because especially for people who are, are in a public service loan forgiveness program, we don't want them to be affected. We are already seeing immense challenges with the public service loan forgiveness program. But I'm going to ask Jessica and Michelle to weigh in as well on this, um, on this issue. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, so if you are on a, uh, if you're working toward public service loan forgiveness or temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness. Um, if you were on a qualifying repayment plan prior to the March uh, payment suspension uh, benefited by the CARES Act, and if you work, continue to work um, throughout the payment suspension period full-time for a qualifying employer, um, then you will receive credit toward public service loan forgiveness, or again, the temporary expanded PSLF program um, for the period of suspended payments, just as though you had made um, on-time monthly payments. So again, if you're in the correct repayment plan prior to the suspension and you continue for the next uh, months covered by the CARES Act to work full-time for a qualifying employer for PSLF, then those payments, uh, those monthly suspended payments will again continue to act just as though they were regular payments that you made in a regular month. Um, in addition, all months of payment suspension will similarly count as qualifying payments if you're working toward forgiveness after years of income-driven repayment. Great, thank you. Is there Wonderful. another question, Allie? There is, yes. And as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom page. Our next question will be from the caller with the screen name, Cynthia Jacobs. Cynthia, your line is unmuted. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. It looks like we're waiting for Cynthia's line to be unmuted. Yeah, there she is. There we go. Okay. I, I apologize. Uh, Hi, thank you all, for thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you for, for doing this call. I think it's really important for folks to hear all the programs that you are supporting and helping uh, to, to make into law. Um, my question, I imposed in the registration process, but for students who were um, 
directly affected during their current semesters as a result of the COVID crisis and had to drop from their graduate programs or their undergraduate programs. Are there any mechanisms in place to help to provide additional support for unexpected summer semesters as they attempt to try to complete their programs of study and perhaps have already um, utilized the 1920 school year um, you know, financial aid supports and so there are no additional monies available to them, but because of dropping, you know, are now forced to add an additional semester? Well, that's a great question. And I'm going to turn to the experts of the Jessica and Michelle. It, it, you certainly have identified a, a gap that needs to be filled. Sure, and, and happy to answer. And this is, again, a great question. And um, another um, you know, unfortunate consequence of this emergency that we're in. Um, but I think that institutions, um, and this is something that similarly to if you have a, a loan that's confusing, it's best to contact your service or lender. Um, I would recommend contacting your institution directly and specifically the financial aid office because there are flexibilities that Congress included in the CARES Act for your institution to be flexible on your loan eligibility or your grant eligibility, again, depending on your specific situation. Um, but they were granted that ability. And so again, I would contact directly your financial aid office and mention specifically the benefits in the CARES Act and that you know that institutions were granted by Congress these new flexibilities to help out their students in very similar situations to yours. Right, which is exactly why the flexibility is there because we want to be able to, to fill those gaps. Thanks, Cynthia. And, and again, if you or anyone needs assistance uh, doing this, please don't hesitate to contact my office. Even though my staff, staff is working remotely, they're uh, consistently checking messages and, and always on email. I think they're working around the clock. So uh, Allie, is there another question? There is. Yeah, live on the line, we have Griffin Frazier. Um, and we'll unmute Griffin's um, line so that you can hear um, a question about coverage gaps and direct payments Great. for 18 to 24 year olds. Hi, Griffin. Hey, how's it going? Good. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for answering my question live. Um, yeah, my question is about this gap of 18 to 24 year old, 24 year old dependents as that is not going to be covered within the CARES Act. as Many of those are college students mm -hmm. as well, and will be having to pay rent still and work and, you know, be let go from their jobs. I'm wondering, there's a push to kind of fill that gap. Yes, absolutely. And we identified that uh, the CARES Act is a, a big bill, massive bill that passed quite quickly. And, uh, and of course, as it's being implemented and as we went along, we understand that there are gaps. That is one of them that has been identified. We're very concerned about that gap, um, but with regard to people who are laid off, we did significantly expand unemployment. Uh, and unemployment, uh, in, uh, in addition to getting the, the regular unemployment that people would have received before, uh, there's an additional $600 a week uh, in uh, unemployment benefits um, because of the CARES Act and also uh, we did expand unemployment benefits for people who would not have uh, qualified before, including gig workers and sort of independent workers, 1099 workers. Um, so uh, that is possible for people who uh, were working and got laid off that they could could benefit from the unemployment. But the the direct payments and that gap is uh, is real serious. So um, thanks, Griffin, for your question. And if you have a follow up, don't hesitate to contact my office. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. Our next question was submitted um, in advance of the event. It's from Andrea in Newburgh and it has three parts. Are the six months of payment and interest provided for in the CARES Act deferred or forgiven? Are parent plus loans included in the, in the CARES provisions? And can federal student loans be refinanced or payments otherwise renegotiated for the long term during this time? Andrea, thank you. Those are all great questions. Uh, the six month payments in the CARES Act are deferred, not forgiven. Uh, so the, there, there's no payments during that six months, but they're, they're not forgiven. They're, they'll still be there uh, at the end of the loan. And then uh, also just to clarify as well that the, the interest will not accrue during that six months. Are Parent PLUS loans covered? 
I think some of them are and some of them aren't, but I'm going to turn to Jessica and Michelle for that. And then can they be refinanced? Um, I don't think so, but I'm going to let Jessica uh, and Michelle answer that as well. However, uh, we are in sort of uncharted territory, and that doesn't mean that, that refinancing won't change. We've already had the conversation about refinancing for a lower rate. I know some people have been converting one loan to a different type of loan, and that can happen, but uh, I'm going to turn uh, for the, the, the nuances of, of Parent Plus and refinancing to our experts, Jessica and Michelle. And thanks again, Andrea. Thanks. I'm happy to, to start out. Um, so any um, direct loans, including direct Parent Plus loans and also direct Graduate Plus loans are covered uh, by the CARES Act. Um, and as far as refinancing, um, that's a great question. Um, so unfortunately, as the Congresswoman said, there is no federal refinancing program currently available. Um, if you choose to refinance your federal loans with a private lender, um, you are able to do so, but um, I would warn you that you are giving up all of the many benefits of a federal student loan. So again, you have, um, you have the option if you were to qualify with a private lender, um, but if you were to do so right now, you would lose out on all of the benefits included in the CARES Act, um, such as the payment suspension, the interest waiver, um, and all of the benefits that Congress included, um, including the ability to access income-driven repayment options and to access any forgiveness options. Um, so again, it is an option to refinance out of the federal program. Again, unfortunately, there is not yet a federal refinancing program available. Um, but if you were to consider refinancing your federal loans outside of the federal program, I would just be very careful uh, to weigh what the consequences of that might be. That's good and advice. I also jump in there too on, on the, because there are some, some uh, plans out there, some private lenders out there that are pretty aggressive. You may get mailers uh, from them, SoFi and others. And um, like Michelle says, you, you, know, you, you really can uh, refinance that way. Uh, but it's important to know too that you have to qualify and of course they're private lenders and so they're going to consider more in terms of your ability to pay and your risk and so your interest rate really can vary a lot as well so keeping in mind that as well that your interest rate could be lower depending on your situation um, but it also could be a lot higher and so that's always one of the things that uh, comes into play when you think about going from a federal loan to a private loan so there can be it can be a fraught uh, move but it is one that is uh, and uh, available for, for those who qualify. I think do your homework is a good message on that one. So mm. th thank you. And, and thanks again, Andrea. Do you have another question, Allie? Yes, next we have a live question from the user with the screen name UZO. UZO has a question about healthcare providers. Your line has been unmuted. Hello. I can see UZO on the screen, hello? We waiting for someone to unmute. Go ahead, uh, user with the screen name UZO, if you'd like to proceed. Okay, well, maybe we should go on to the next one and then come back to UZO. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, now we can hear you. Terrific. Okay, good. that was that was close. Uh, so my question essentially is the way I phrased it, and I'll just go ahead and read it just to be sure. succinct and save everyone's time here. Uh, so nurses and healthcare providers have demonstrated yet again their unwavering service and sacrifice to our communities. How can we honor this service akin to military service member support bills, such as, you know, canceling all student debt for this specific group? Is this too bold of an ask? I don't think it's too bold of an ask at all. When we look at the work that's being done on the front lines, uh, nurses and healthcare providers are uh, out there risking their health and safety, especially with uh, oftentimes inadequate personal protective equipment in a very uncertain time. And I know there are conversations about that uh, forgiveness. And we do have um, programs like the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program and other programs that are designed to incentivize people to go into particular fields of study. I don't think it's too bold of an ask at all in light of what our uh, frontline workers are doing right now to save lives. Thank you for that question. Okay. Thank you. Do we have another question? We do. Now we'll turn to more of the questions that were submitted in advance of the event. We have a question from Lily in King City. Many of my student loans have co-signers. Can I get relief without burdening them at this time? 
Oh, Lily, that's a, oh, that was a pre Mm -hmm. any question, right? I was, I was looking for Lily on the screen. Um, Lily, that's a great question. Um, I'm not as familiar with cosigner provisions, but my, I anticipate that Jessica and Michelle can answer that. Jessica, Michelle, do you have um, some thoughts on the cosigner provision? I Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, Thanks. So uh, it is a great question and one I'm, I've, I'm sure many borrowers have. Um, so uh, federal student loans actually don't require a cosigner. So I'm going to assume that Lily is talking about a private loan, um, which does often require a cosigner. Um, so I think again, as we spoke earlier about the lack of private loan options included in the CARES Act, um, again, there are still a number of options if you contact your lender um, and specifically ask them about your situation and share that you are particularly concerned about not burdening your cosigner and what options they may have available to you. Um, again, I know a lot of private lenders are trying to give borrowers leeway and again, um, cosigners can be included in that. So I would recommend, um, unfortunately, I wish I could give you more. Um, <laughs> I know the Congresswoman is working working on getting more for, for borrowers, but I think um, at this point, just contacting your lender and asking them for what assistance they can offer is the best advice we can give. And Lily, I wanna add, um, I worked at Legal Aid uh, for some time uh, and my specialty at the time was helping people who were struggling financially. Um, they had typically been people who had either lost a job or had massive medical bills they couldn't pay and they just didn't know what to do and we'd always start out by contacting their creditors. So oftentimes, if you ask, um, they will be uh, willing to work with you. So you have to start by asking. And uh, that's true, and especially now in these challenging times. I think you'll find uh, some uh, reception to a request. And if you need um, any assistance with that, please don't hesitate to contact my office. Thank you. Do you have another question, Allie? We do. Next, we have a live question from Christina. Christina has a question about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. And Christina, your line should be unmuted. Hi, can you guys hear me? Hi, Christina, we can. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question is in regards to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, I'm currently a medical social worker at a nonprofit hospice, and I'm about three years into the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. And of course, through the current administration, I'm definitely worried about the future of the program. Um, Congresswoman, can you comment or do you have any insights onto what's going on in the federal government in regards to this program? Absolutely, and thank you for that question. Now, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program started, it was enacted in 2007. Uh, and uh, when the first cohort became eligible after 10 years in 2017, um, we found that a very, very small percentage of people were actually getting the forgiveness they had earned. And this is a, this is a really critical issue because people made education decisions, financial decisions, life decisions based on the promise of this program, which was turning out to be an empty promise. So then in 2000, 2018, Congress passed legislation basically directing the Department of Education to fix the public service loan forgiveness program. And so now they're approving somewhere between 2% uh, and 1% and 2%. So it's still unacceptable. And it is a priority of mine and many of us on the Education and Labor Committee. And in the legislation, the pending legislation called the College Affordability Act uh, is a significant fix to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Uh, I'm a big believer in the program. These are our positions that we, uh, it, it makes sense to incentivize people incentivize people to go into these programs and they should not be strapped with a lot of debt um, that they had to incur to get the credentials to work in these programs. So uh, we are working hard on fixing it. In the meantime, uh, during uh, the, the pandemic, uh, it's a, an extra challenging time and I appreciate that. But uh, I want to do, Jessica and Michelle, would you like to add anything about public service loan forgiveness program? But, but just know, Christina, that uh, we are working on making sure that program works uh, for people who, who uh, are in it and made decisions about it. And we know that we're not there yet, but we're certainly working to, to do what we need to do. Yeah, um, absolutely. I would just add, Christina, that um, I, I, would, I, I would encourage you not to worry too much to continue on your course. 
to complete your employment certification forms every year. They're not actually required to be completed every year, but it helps. It's a good way for you to see that you're on track and um, in, in the right repayment plan and with, with a qualified employer. Um, and also know that, you know, these six months uh, of suspended payments, it really is a big uh, thing that in the CARES Act, um, you know, advocates were able to fight for these to call, count towards your PSLF, which is, you know, a pretty significant get for um, what is a 10 year program is half a year out of that 10 years. So my hope is not only that, uh, you know, you really don't need to worry and you've got uh, a lot of people in Congress making sure that that, that will be the case, um, but also that, you know, you will um, sort of come out with a little with at least, you know, a six month um, bump in terms of, you know, ultimately how much you're going to have to pay before you, you get to that light at the end of the tunnel. So that would be my overall uh, message to you is that you're right, that there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of stuff going on around how it is, uh, how hard it is to navigate and, uh, and get through to that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but I really do feel confident that, you know, whatever happens, you, you will get there and to keep on your course and not stress about it. That's really good advice. Um, Christina, I also want to add, I, I don't know if you were able to attend the uh, student um, debt workshop that I had uh, in Beaverton a, a while back. Uh, and if you contact my office, we can send, if you weren't able to be there, we can send you the slides from that and the information because there was a lot of detail and really helpful information about the public service loan forgiveness program. So we, we're happy to provide that to you. And thanks for your question. Great, thank you. Our next question was submitted in advance of the event. It's from Friday in Tualatin. And Friday asks, how can I work with Navient to get the lowest repayment option? Well, thank you, Friday. Um, the, it, it is challenging sometimes, but uh, again, it's really important uh, to work with your lender, uh, to, to contact them and explain the situation that you're in. Um, and I'll ask Jessica and Michelle if they have any suggestions for working with Navient. Sure. Great question. Um, so again, if you're fed, if you are if you have federal loans um, that are serviced by Naviant that are covered by the CARES Act, um, you don't have to take any action to get the payment suspension and all the other benefits included in the CARES Act. Um, but if you do in fact have private loans and Naviant is your lender, um, the first thing again I would do is log on to your online account, um, review what your options are, and then contact your lender directly um, for specific information and ask them explicitly for what kind of relief options they can offer you. Um, I know Naviant and I think a number of other lenders are specifically offering um, some period of time of forbearance um, where you don't have to make payments and you won't face consequences. Um, I don't, again, think these are as significant as what is included for federal borrowers, but there are relief options um, to pause your payments so you don't go into delinquency or default. There are potentially rate reduction programs that can reduce your interest rate or reduce your monthly payment amount, again, without consequences, um, or some kind of interest-only payment program, an extended repayment program, or something of that, of that sort. So again, um, our best advice would be to contact your lender, explain to them your situation, and explicitly ask them what relief options they have for you and how they can help you during this time. Thanks, Michelle. How are we doing, Allie? Do we have another question? We sure do. Um, our next question is from Ashley in Portland, and Ashley submitted this question in advance. Ashley wants to know um, about higher education healthcare programs. They charge high tuition fees, are in especially high demand, and yet students are entering an uncertain job market. How is leadership lobbying for students that have accrued debt in order to work in healthcare? Um, thank you so much for that question, Ashley. And uh, Healthcare careers are so critical, and we're seeing that now. Uh, huge demand for uh, people with healthcare backgrounds. Um, and uh, I, I want to again talk about the public service loan forgiveness program for people going into uh, public service. A, a lot of public health offices are at the forefront right now in this pandemic, um, and they're they're great careers typically. Um, but again, finances can be barriers to people entering them. And that's why we need to have a lot of options available, whether it be public service loan forgiveness program, um, the College Affordability Act has uh, significant e increases in Pell Grants and the Reform of Work Study and a lot of different programs that will help 
uh, lead toward that debt-free higher education that I know is my goal and something that, that um, our, our TICAS experts talked about as well. Um, Jessica or Michelle, do you have any thoughts on higher ed healthcare programs? Um, you know, I think uh, I think just generally that this is <clears throat> an issue that is top of the mind uh, for and, and just so folks know, there is a broader conversation that's really important that's happening around the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, as, as um, has been mentioned a couple of times with regards to the College Affordability Act, which is a uh, one form of that um, in, in pending legislation. So there are a lot of really big picture issues around affordability um, and also frankly, return on investment and making sure that colleges and programs are high quality uh, and, and, and what you know the, the net costs are for students in, in addition to um, overall equity gaps as well in terms of access uh, to those types of high demand um, but also high cost programs that can be, um, the cost can be a barrier for, uh, you know, students of color and low income students. So there are a lot of really important issues embedded in that question. And I would say that they are certainly top of the mind of many, many advocates, student ad centered advocates and uh, members of Congress. And so I can't say when we will uh, get significant um, new policy around that but it is certainly uh, an active discussion. Indeed, and I know particularly with um, uh, specific areas, for example, rural healthcare access is a, a real challenge and there are um, um, discrete programs uh, set aside for people who uh, go work in rural areas and work in healthcare in rural areas. So there, there are lots of different angles to that, but it's something that affordability uh, and access are both uh, the, the top of my mind as a leader on the Education Labor Committee. Thank you for your question. How are we doing, Allie? Good, I think this will be the last question tonight. Oh, goodness, and okay. This question was submitted in advance by Catherine and Scapoose. Catherine says, what are you doing to reduce or eliminate the interest accruing on these student loans? The interest rates have doubled the original loan amount and it's the interest that is hard to pay back, not the principal. Um, that's a great question, Catherine, and uh, certainly a challenge for many. Uh, I've spoken with people who say, I keep making payments, but I'm not getting ahead because my interest rate is so high. So I certainly support allowing um, refinancing to a lower interest rate, but also um, there may be programs. Well, right now, if, you're, uh, if, the federal, if it's a federal loan, uh, the interest is on hold for six months, um, and so are the payments, which is critical. Uh, but th there are also programs like income-driven repayment that may be helpful depending on your circumstances. Uh, but it is a challenge when uh, the, inter uh, the interest is, is continuing to accrue uh, and you're not making a difference on the principal. I'm gonna ask Jessica and Michelle to, to weigh in on this as well. Thank you. Yeah, this is also, um, I, I second the fact that it's a really good question and a great point. And we have heard um, a lot of anxiety uh, and worry out of borrowers who, who, from borrowers who are seeing that, like you say, you're putting your, you're making your payments faithfully, you're in good standing, you see your balance growing. Um, unfortunately, this is also something that tends to uh, apply to borrowers who are in a program that's very important to them, which is income-driven repayment. Uh, because if your income is low, as many of you right. may know, if you're in income driven repayment, it allows your payment to be lower than, you know, what might cover even your, in, your interest portion of the debt, which means that you are in negative amortization, which means your interest is your ba total balance is actually growing. Um, I think that long term, there, there are, again, a lot of folks who are interested. Uh, our organization is actively looking at policy solutions to address this and help restrain um, the uh, growing balances due to accruing interest. Um, we also want to really make sure, and this uh, relates back to uh, legislation that um, is sponsored by the Congresswoman that was mentioned earlier, uh, to make sure that people, for example, are able to more easily stay in IDR and not have that accrued interest um, capitalized, for example, which can be a particularly uh, costly thing to happen for, for a borrower. Uh, so we are actively working on that and aware of that issue. Uh, that said, I would also say, well, as hard as it is, if you are in income-driven repayment um, and you are staying in good standing and out of default, um, to, to know that that is the most important thing 
uh, and uh, hopefully that light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the forgiveness and in terms of the uh, payment calculation. I hope that it's affordable. There are open questions about that too, um, I know, but uh, I hope that to the extent possible, uh, you can focus on uh, those benefits, um, but completely agree. And we are very aware of and trying to work on good solutions for that, for that issue. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. That's a good point that a lot of people who are, if they have low income and a high uh, balance uh, income driven repayment might not be the best option. And, you know, it, it, I think my message here is that unfortunately, a lot of these things are very complicated and each situation is unique. And that's why it's important to, to, to if you can, uh, work with your lender servicer or uh, find someone to help. And, and again, I offer my office. Tikus has been wonderful to work with. Um, and there are a lot of resource out there, resources out there to help um, people navigate these complicated programs. Uh, but, but it must be incredibly frustrating to be making pay payments and then not seeing that principal balance go down. And I do also want to say that before we close, um, I think, uh, you know, again, you can go to tikus.org. We have mailing lists you can sign up for and you can specify which, which issue areas you're most interested in um, getting regular updates from us in terms of what's happening on these issues, uh, helpful resources, and also please reach out to us and we're on Twitter. We're on Facebook and you can reach out to us with questions. And if we can't answer them, we don't do a lot of direct borrower work. We really are focused on policy. We're very small, but we have a lot of partners that we work with um, that we can also try to connect you with the right resource as well. And so we're happy to do that um, at any time. That's great. And I think okay. Michelle Streeter had one closing comment. Terrific, great. Oh, sure. I'll have some as well. Sure, just uh, wanted to quickly, um, if there's anyone listening or watching the recording later, um, and you aren't sure if you're covered um, by the CARES Act and you aren't sure what type of loan you have, just wanted to make sure that you have that information because that's something we've been hearing a lot from borrowers. Um, so you can use the National Student Loan Data System. Um, it's online, just type into Google, National Student Loan Data System. Um, you will log in with your FSA ID. That's the same ID you use to fill out your FAFSA and your financial aid forms. Um, and that will tell you what kind of loans you have, who your servicer is, and that will allow you to know uh, if you're covered by these benefits. Thanks. Well, thanks so much to, to Jessica. Michelle and Tikus for all your work, but thank you to everyone for joining us. I know this is a really challenging time uh, in many ways and having uh, challenges, additional challenges with student loan debt uh, is really, really tough for folks. I'm, I'm here to help. It's something that I care about greatly, having the, the lived experience and know what you're going through and really want to be a resource to help you. Again, uh, you can access my website uh, access my office through my website, or you can call 503-469-6010. And even though my staff is working remotely and all staying safe, uh, they are constantly checking those messages and we're more than happy to help you. Um, I mentioned that I had a, a wonderful student debt workshop recently, and we're happy to share those materials to if people are interested in those. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us and please stay healthy out there, stay safe uh, and I appreciate your participation. Thanks again. Thank you everyone. Thank you.